So thank you, Nea, for inviting me. Uh, we, we've known each other a long time when we were junior members on the advisory board of the European Journal of International Law. That was the time we met. And uh, last time I was here was in 2007, as, uh, uh, when there was not yet any easy jet, any flight connection probably to this place uh, for a workshop organized by uh, Joe Shaw and by Neil Walker. So it has really been a uh, long outstanding that I'm coming. And uh, Nehal also kindly imposed on you a long reading, so I don't expect everybody to have read it. Uh, but the paper is exactly based on the reading and there is also a handout which Nehal distributed. And if there is still a spare copy, I also want one actually. Ah, okay. I need one too. So all that said, I'm really happy to be here. And this time I came, I came by Landway. That's also th something to mention. But this was not following Greta, but because there was a storm in continental Europe. And so I couldn't fly. And that's why I had to take the train. And it took me three days to come here. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, but I had some stops in between. Um, so now let's, uh, let's uh, move to the topic. Uh, the title is uh, Global Constitutionalism, the Social Dimension. Um, and I would like to start with the example of uh, the outbreak uh, of the coronavirus uh, disease in China. Uh, this illustrates, I find, the combination of uh, political oppression and deficient social and health services in a country. The health service can badly cope with the virus one of the reasons is that it was covered up at the beginning and you all read in the papers that Dr. Li, who first informed his colleagues about the new virus, was con uh, convened to the police and had to undersign that he would uh, shut up and now he's dead, killed by the virus at the age of 34. And social networks now start complaining both about intransparency and censorship more generally and about the health service in China. So this unfolding crisis once again shows that we are in a globalized constellation. Whatever post-globalists and nationalists assert to the contrary, the disease is global and in fact uh, we can't escape it. Second and equally important for my talk uh, is that the coronavirus crisis demonstrates the frequent confluence of material and ideational deprivation of poverty and bondage. Concomitantly, political opposition demanding reforms and social unrest up to revolt and revolution usually react against both harms, uh, not only against deprivations of freedom such as censorship and discrimination, but also against the denial of basic social needs. And if you look back at the year 2019, which has been called a year of upheaval and unrest in many regions of the world, it was all about these both things, rising gas prices, rising bread prices, and also corruption and endless uh, prolongation renewals uh, of leaders which don't want to uh, make place for new candidates. So the key point is nowadays that this classic interdependence and interaction of the ideational condition and the material condition of life nowadays happens in a globalized environment. What has been called the social question can no longer, cannot be resolved on the national level. And indeed, international law and governing institutions are responding. The main objective of my talk is to highlight and to pull together these trends, which I call trends towards a more social international law. And then in part three, uh, that's on the second part of the handout, I suggest to analyze these trends through the lens of global constitutionalism. First, I need to clarify what I mean by social, and I now in the talk don't focus on social in the broad sense, social as everything connected to society, to a group, as the opposite of private or individual, for example, as in contrat social. Uh, rather, I focus on social in a narrower sense, as an attribute of laws, policies, and institutions which seek to improve the material living conditions of humans and which seek to mitigate poverty and inequality of wealth and income. And domestic legal institutions which do this job are known as the welfare state or the social state. But the welfare state is under stress. Already in 1990, sociologist Ulrich Beck had written, I quote Beck, that the premises of the welfare state melt under the withering sun of globalization. Because globalization is 
has been called essentially neoliberalism writ large. It's today obvious that the Washington consensus has not delivered the promise of welfare for all through trickle-down effects realized through the market. It's therefore not surprising that the then managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, in 2016, identified a groundswell of discontent with globalization. Awareness of the dark sides of globalization has changed the political tides. We see the timid expressions of a more social and a more individualized international legal framework which is in the making. And this is not to deny that international law was from its beginning on uh, a droit international liberal providence, as Emmanuel uh, Joannet called it, liberal and welfareist. International law has worked and is working on the dual agenda of promoting both freedom and prosperity. However, my claim is that the new social law is a bit different and the crucial difference between the old interstate international law of solidarity and the interstate law of development and the now new more social law is the new attention to individuals to individuals across state boundaries and international law acknowledges that's my claim a cross-border social responsibility for individuals as i will now try to demonstrate and i now reach my main part the five trends in the direction of a more social international law. And I use the year 2015 as a marker, of course, simplified marker for a turn of the tide when the UN General Assembly adopted the Agenda 2030. The first trend is the emergence of an international law against poverty. That's a response to the failure of classical international development law. Sustainable development goal number one is end poverty in all its forms everywhere. The World Bank has espoused the fight against poverty as its major new cause and has to some extent supplanted its traditional focus on development, which is now understood as human development and good governance. In this policy, the needs of the individual are the ultimate normative reference point. But what has been touted as a success by the World Bank has been called into question by critical analysis. Notably, the philosopher Thomas Pogge has relentlessly uncovered flaws in the World Bank's definitions, in the World Bank's measurements, and other data on poverty. Pogge went as far as criticizing the MDG of eradicating poverty as, I quote Pogge, a cruel joke upon the poor, the celebration of a vast crime against humanity, end of quote. Even if we don't want to go as far as Pogge, it remains unclear how much, if at all, international law and international institutions contributed to lifting people out of poverty worldwide. As a matter of fact, what happened notably in Asia, rising thousands of people out of poverty, is possibly totally independent of any World Bank program against poverty. The second trend is the emergence of an international law against inequality. <laughs> Any more news? <laughs> so, to put it simply, it, the current constellation during a period of intense economic globalization accompanied by repeated financial crisis is roughly one of a convergence of wealth, so a decreasing material inequality among states between rich and poor <coughs> states, but accompanied by a growing material inequality of individuals within states. And this inter-individual inequality inside states has been recently acknowledged as an issue for international law and governance, for example, by the World Bank. In his foreword to the first issue of a new World Bank series of studies on poverty, the World Bank president writes, I quote him, Today we face a powerful threat to progress around the world, inequality. Today inequality is constraining national economies and destabilizing global collaboration in ways that put humanity's most critical achievements and aspirations at risk, writes the World Bank president.
And in the Agenda 2030 declaration, the heads of state and government and high representatives, I quote the Agenda 2030, resolve between now and 2030 to end poverty and hunger everywhere, to combat inequalities within and among countries. Not only among, but within. That's the aspiration of Agenda 2030. And in order to reduce both interstate and intrastate, so inside state inequality, Goal 10.4 is to adopt policies, especially fiscal wage and social protection policies, and progressively achieve greater <coughs> equality. This focus on intrastate and transboundary inequality among individuals is novel in international law. Of course, we're only speaking about soft law here. The stagnation of the bottom incomes in rich states combined with climbing middle incomes in developing states are likely to have destabilizing effects in the rich states of the Northwest and have in fact already triggered protectionism and opposition against trade and investment agreements, as you know. And therefore the cross-border material inequality of individuals' living standards is, I submit, a proper focus of international law. The third trend is the extension of international social rights in three dimensions. The first dimension is the extension ratione materia, so in substance, international social rights have radiated into all subfields of international law that are relevant for the global social question. The imbuement with rights has left deep marks in the international law of development, in international labor law, international trade law, international investment law, finance law, international law of natural disasters, refugee migrant law, and finally anti-corruption law. The other extension of international social rights is territorial. The extraterritorial application of international ESC rights, so economic, social and cultural rights, has been discussed intensely. And the political starting point is the claim that, due to global interdependence, the legal, political and administrative action of states in the fields of trade or any other area of the economy increasingly has negative repercussions on the social rights of people situated outside the territory. Importantly, the core issue is not state conduct, for example, police action or military action outside state borders, but rather the extraterritorial effects of measures which are adopted inside the state. This includes the state's regulation, or rather the state's non-regulation of business actors domiciled inside its territory, but whose activities may have an adverse impact on social rights enjoyed by persons outside the territory. Trade laws of states, import restrictions, export subsidies for agricultural products, or the refusal to award development aid potentially affects housing, food and work of persons situated in other states and therefore possibly also their related rights to housing, food and so on. Of course, in times of economic globalization, Every state is somehow connected to the populations and business activity in other states. So we need criteria which determine the threshold above which extraterritorial human rights based obligations of a state, A, are triggered in the first place. And this threshold might be discussed in terms of jurisdiction. However, the criterion <coughs> of control which has emerged from the case law under the European Court of Human Rights and also in the ICCPR uh, committee as the main element of jurisdiction, so this criteria of control hardly fits in constellations <coughs> of mere extraterritorial social effects uh, of intraterritorial state action. It does not make any sense to look for control of the US legislator awarding a rice subsidy to domestic farmers which harms African farmers. The US Congress will never control the African farmers. So the control criterion doesn't fit here. The criteria proposed by the 2011 Maastricht principles, you maybe know them, are exceedingly broad and too broad, I would say. So the <coughs> crucial question remains the boundary problem, to use a term by Matthias Risse, and I can't resolve that question here. Maybe we can come to it in the discussion. The third extension is uh, of international social rights is the extension of the duty bearers beyond the state as a duty bearer. Social human rights obligations have firstly been extended to international organizations and second to business actors. 
One constellation involves international financial institutions, which directly or indirectly finance state policies or development projects which affect social rights of the populations. Or when lending or other forms of financial support to states or to their banks is conditioned on privatization requirements or on other austerity prescriptions like budget cuts, downsizing the bureaucracy and so on. Uh, and another scenario is the restructuring of sovereign foreign debt in which international organizations are also involved. All this um, affects social rights. The World Bank's new environmental and social framework setting uh, of 2016, or maybe there's a later edition, I'm not sure, is attentive to social impacts of the World Bank's investment project financing. In this document, which is of course a political document, the bank does not assume any own human rights obligation, is careful to deny any own obligation. However, the bank commits itself to conduct a due diligence of proposed projects, and the due diligence will supposed to cover the environmental and also the social risks and impacts related to projects financed by the bank. The next issue is the substance of potential social human rights obligations of international organizations, such as the World Bank. It's quite clear that international organizations are currently not deemed to be obliged to fulfill social rights. For example, the World Bank does not seem to be obliged to furnish any housing to populations transferred by projects itself. In the context of financing, in the context of lending and debts, specific obligations of the international financial institutions are to take into account or to pay consideration to human rights. I would say that these obligations to take into account are a new type of obligations that do not fit with the classic uh, trias of respect, protect and fulfill. One word on business, um, social human rights obligations of business, the trend is not clearly moving towards direct human rights obligations of business um, and I find direct social human rights obligations of business indeed problematic because uh, they, not because, but well, they erode the public and the private sphere uh, distinction which is of course blurry uh, but as a matter of principle makes some sense I think. Mainly there is the danger that if you say that business is directly bound by human rights, then there is this danger that states might shirk their own human rights obligations. Even in the revised draft of the UN Human Rights Council open-ended intergovernmental working group on transnational corporations and other business enterprises with respect to human rights, you know that this process is ongoing in the Human Rights Council, and the recent, the, the first draft published in July last year, doesn't propose direct human rights obligations, but proposes states' duties to prevent, regulate, hold liable, and effectively sanction transnational business actors, but through the domestic law of the states only. I think that this is a sensible approach. I think it's more promising for holding business actors to account to force states to exercise their duty to protect and to shape a tighter web of both national and international social law, a more fine-tuned web than just human rights. So a normative web composed of labor law, composed of social rights and environmental law, which could realize the social responsibility of business. The fourth trend is that courts and other monitoring bodies have begun to adjudicate on social rights. Notably, the constitutional courts of South Africa and India have issued judgments on constitutional social rights interpreted in the light of international law and in the light of foreign law. On the European regional level, the European Court of Human Rights has acknowledged and built up social rights under the European Convention of Human Rights. In the EU, the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights of 2000 has become operational in the court's case law and importantly also the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in a leading case Lagos del Campo versus Peru of 2017 has for the first time found a violation uh, of the uh, general clause, social rights clause uh, of the American Convention on Human Rights. 
And as you know, on the universal plane, the first optional protocol to the International Social Covenant allows, since 2013, individual communications about violations of the Social Covenant rights to the Social Rights Committee, which gives these rights more <coughs> teeth than through state reporting. And some individual communications have already led to findings of violations of social rights. For example, the first uh, communication was about right to housing in Spain and the committee found a violation. The last trend I note of the five trends which com contribute to this trend towards a more international social law, a more social international law, is, so the last trend is the function of social rights as a background grid for practices and procedures which seek to prevent cross-border social harm. The tools are first social impact assessment, human rights impacts assessment, and second uh, human rights due diligence, social human rights due diligence, and thirdly social and human rights mainstreaming. I'm now reaching my interim conclusion on the handout. <laughs> I put it in a <laughs> box. In an era of a new global awareness about the fallouts generated by ruthless globalization, the trends I mentioned manifest the recognition not only of interstate obligations or solidarity, as it was said in the classic international law of development, but of additional but very weakly legalized responsibilities for the material welfare of individuals independent of the individual's nationality and independent of the individual's place of residence. I call this a form of cross-border social responsibility for human beings. And the main legal component of the cross-border social responsibility for human beings is an international law-based obligation for states and for international organizations to properly integrate consideration for material needs of humans in other states into domestic decision-making in all relevant fields of law and policy. Importantly now, please listen now, what I have described as the rise of social rights comprises two com features which are at first sight contradictory. On the one hand, the rights function as entitlements, and this function is being sharpened notably through the new enforcement practices, judici justiciability through courts. On the other hand, the social rights form a mere background noise when they are used as a guideline for the interpretation of hard rules, for example, in trade and investment. However, both functions of rights as enforceable entitlements and as mere interpretative guidelines can coexist, I would say, without cancelling each other out. Taking as a whole the social thickening of international law in form of the cross-border social responsibility for humans has a constitutional significance. And this is part three, which I'll keep short, huh, because Neil said I have to be short because he wants to attack me. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, we can uh, employ the lens of global constitutionalism, which enjoys some prominence in these quarters, so I think it's sad, and fuse the constitutionalist and the social dimension of international or transnational law in order to reconceptualize the problem and to provide an intellectual framework. Um, as you know, global constitutionalism is so far focused on the trinity of the rule of law, human rights and democracy. But the positive and negative feedback loops between the realization of classical liberal goals on the one hand and the guarantee of minimally acceptable material living conditions on the other hand make it impossible to satisfy the classic constitutionalist quests without simultaneously addressing the social question. And in an interconnected world both the social question and the constitutional question have gone global. And the fusion of the social program and of the constitutionalist program to form an agenda of global social constitutionalism has the benefit of upgrading the social concern to the level of importance it deserves and is also apt to rescue global constitutionalism from Eurocentrism and from blindless 
towards the collateral damage of economic globalization. I put seven advantages of a constitutionalist approach on the handout, but that's not the main topic uh, today. Um, I want to just conclude that this agenda of a global socialist constitutionalism must accept three qualifications, and that's my conclusion. First, the recent emergence of the more social international law does not comprise the establishment of central institutions which would be in any way comparable to welfare state bureaucracies. Now that's totally out of the question. So this makes it impossible to design and implement global insurance schemes. Impossible to define and successfully levy global progressive taxes, for example, which could deploy redistributive effects and which would finance social measures ranging from schools to hospitals. This is currently, it's simply, uh, as a political matter, it's completely out, out of the reach. So the structure of this very tentative global social governance remains decentralized and horizontal. This form of governance without any enforcement powers is, of course, typical for international law. But it is hard to see how such a decentralized system could ever manage money flows and contribute to redistributing money. The second qualification is that even the very modest unfolding of the social dimension of international law without, as I said, any global top-down scheme of redistribution, at first sight, sits ill with an equally tangible backlash in other, more traditional areas of international law. This backlash is, of course, totally obvious. Classical core jobs of international law, such as preventing military conflict, guaranteeing stable territorial boundaries, and providing for interstate dispute settlement, these core jobs are currently badly fulfilled. So there is a dissonance between open critique amounting to non-compliance in the areas of international militis, milit military security issues, territorial issues, these are the core jobs of international law. On the other hand, when I now say we even have to go in this direction of a more social international law, we need more social rules, this seems to be contradictory. However, I think it's no real contradiction because the symbolic topics, such as sovereignty, are merely verbally detached from economic interdependence. In reality, populist rhetorics, insisting on state sovereignty, insisting on territorial integrity, insisting on national identity, are a typical reaction to the anxiety of governments and the anxiety of the voters caused by economic globalization. For this reason, tackling the global social question is, I would say, one precondition for the successful delivery of the classic core jobs of international law, such as peace and territorial stability. Third qualification, of course, the ongoing socialization of international law and its framing, as I suggested, within a global social constitutionalism is purely incremental and it's a reformist approach and it lacks any revolutionary impetus. But against bad historical experience with revolution, I claim that a reform strategy with international social rights, notably the right not to live in abject poverty, is uh, worth trying. And uh, along that line, global constitutionalism as an ism, as an ideology, should move further towards embracing a social dimension. And this can, and I think should be done analytically, by acknowledging that the extant bits and pieces of an international social law, social law which already do form part of the body of international law uh, exist and normatively through developing legal arguments, legal processes and strategies to strengthen the social aspiration as a matter of global constitutional justice. Thank you. Thank you.